Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome on behalf of all of us, Nancy. So welcome, uh, Nancy, on behalf of all of us. Uh, we're really, really happy that you acceded to our ex request and have agreed to give us this really unique talk. I may say that so myself. I am partial to Nelly Setna, as you know. But on behalf of the chairperson and the trustees of the CSMVS Museum, the Director General, Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Museum Society and myself, our members, and all our guests who are joining us here this evening, welcome, Nancy. And we are grateful to you for delivering this lecture to the Museum Society of Mumbai, CSMVS. A few words about our speaker this evening. Especially those of you who know her in Bombay, she needs no introduction. But those of you who have joined us from across India and outside India, please indulge me for a few seconds. I should say a few minutes. Nancy Adajanya is a Bombay-based cultural theorist and curator. She has curated a number of research-based exhibitions, including the Nelly Setna retrospective at Chatterjee and Lal, with Simrosa Art Gallery, which is currently on in Bombay, 2021. She's also done zigzag afterlives, film experiments from the 1960s and 1970s in India, Camden Arts Center, London, 2020, the renowned Sudhir Patwadhan retrospective at NGMA Mumbai with the Guild Art Gallery in 2019, and Counter Canon, Counter Culture, Alternative Histories of Indian Art for the Serendipity Arts Festival Goa in 2019. Nancy has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writings on subaltern art, media art, public art, transcultural art, and the Biennale culture from the Global South. She conceptualized and led an online curatorial workshop titled once upon a cultural fa famine, a curatorial thought experiment for the Kochi Biennale Foundation in 2021. She comes to us with a fund of knowledge, strong grounding in theory, and we are really looking forward to this lecture on Nelly Setna. A few words about what we're about to hear. The unpaved, crusty, and earthy road. Nancy will elaborate on that as she goes ahead this evening, is the first ever retrospective of the fiber artist and textile designer and crafts activist, Nelly Setna, who was born in 1932 and passed away in 1992. Her practice was intensely experimental and exceedingly versatile. Curated by Nancy Adajanya, this Pure, rigorous, research-based exhibition is the first attempt to account for the long arc of Setna's practice. Nancy locates Setna's practice at the intersection of multiple artistic genealogies, informed by Sloyd-inspired Nordic modernism, by the ecumenical arts and crafts lineage of Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay a pioneer of the 20th century crafts revival movement in India. In this lecture, Nancy will speak about the research and archival dimensions of her curation of this exhibition. Adajanya will discuss how she employed the mode of oral history, piercing together a mosaic of fragmentary memories and uncatalogued information, developing a chronology for Setna's practice by reference to external historical narr narratives, some of which have never before been considered relevant to her work. When you go to the exhibition, you'll see a large 20 foot wall giving you all this wonderful information which we are going to hear about this evening. Nancy has questioned and received narratives concerning Nelly's work and created a new framework within which to situate it. Using empirical evidence, as she says, 
she proposes a radical interpretation of Setna's career as an expanded collaborative practice, which she defines as the Nelly Setna Studio. This curatorial research opens up new possibilities for art history, as well as crafts history and the history of textile design in India. I have my two favorite ends in front of me today. My dear, dear Nelly, who we lost many years ago. She was a wonderful human being, an unsung hero, along with her husband, Homi Setna, and my other end, Nancy Adajanya. So my two ends, thank you so much for this, what is going to be a lovely evening, a lot of learning, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure you all will appreciate it at the end of the session. So Nancy, once more, my grateful thanks to you for doing this and getting all your thoughts together. And before I end, I have to thank my technical team, always ably led by Jason Johns, Yashraj, Aishwarya, and Rinalini. Thank you so much for being with us, event after event, lecture after lecture, sometimes two and three times in the week. So now over to you, Nancy. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Tech team. Thank you, Feroza, for this very, very generous introduction. I'll just share my screen. So once again, Feroza, thank you so much for the generous introduction and also for inviting me to curate this retrospective. Uh, as uh, many of you in Bombay know, the Nelly Setna retrospective is uh, one of the trifecta uh, one of the three exhibitions, which comprise Simrosa at 50, which comprise the Simrosa at 50 celebrations. And had Firoza not collected Nelly Setna, we would not have had this exhibition. She had the foresight and the acumen to not only collect the works of artists such as Nelly Setna, uh, but also uh, the works of subaltern artists, photographers, printmakers, ceramicists, and, and I think that the Simrosa at 50 celebrations is in a way also a, a way of honoring uh, Firoza's vision, which uh, was not restrict, restricted only to, uh, to the dominant medium of the day, which was painting, but which was an expansive vision. And today we are in a way enjoying the fruits of that expansive vision. So thank you, Firoza, and thank you Motima Chatterjee and Tara Lal for hosting this retrospective. And with that, and of course, there are many, many uh, more people that I'd, I'd need to thank, but I think I'll do that when I bring out my book. So with that, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with, with my research work, which led to the making of the unpaved, crusty, earthy road. So I begin with um, the first slide. So this is a beautiful photograph by Sunni Taraporwala. Uh, it's taken in 1985. And as you can see here, uh, there's Homi uh, along with uh, Nelly Setna. And this is how I also remembered Homi and Nelly uh, during my college days when I used to go to the NCPA to watch a film or listen to a lecture. And um, Homi would be speeding past us with Nelly Setna safely uh, en ensconced in the side chair. And as you can see this uh, scooter, uh, it was uh, quite a unique sight uh, in those days because it almost looks like a rocket which is ready to take off into interstellar space. And um, I have some uh, very warm memories of the Setnas uh, uh, as we uh, as we pass them uh, while uh, while uh, entering um, uh, the, uh, entering uh, you know I mean a film screening or uh, or or uh, actually also also sad memory when I remember when uh, Nelly who was suffering from multiple sclerosis towards the end of her life I remember she trying to articulate something but uh, even her speech had been affected by multiple sclerosis but she still wanted to speak. And I think that that's uh, an important aspect of Nelly's personality that she never gave up. Uh, the reason why I'm starting this lecture on a, on a personal note is because when I was, uh, during my college days, uh, I, uh, I had heard of uh, Nelly's pioneering revival of Kalamkari. 
And uh, later in the mid 90s, uh, I uh, was the founder programs coordinator of uh, the Moorcrafts uh, department at the NCPA. And uh, at that time, I uh, conceptualized and organized uh, a symposium called Should the Arts uh, Survive? Sorry, Should the Crafts Survive? There you go. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the specter of art is always there in a way overshadowing everything else. So the symposium was called Should the Crafts Survive? And I remember inviting Guru Pachetti, the Kalamkari artist, and Satinar and Lalkar and the Mithila artist to inaugurate the symposium. And, and then have the other um, activists um, and anthropologists and economists speak. And uh, along with Guru Pachetti, I had also invited uh, Roshan Kalapesi, who was a close friend of the Setnas and was the founder of Paramparik Karigar. And uh, we have an interview in the exhibition, a rare interview, uh, where, uh, where Roshan is interviewing uh, Nelly. And uh, this, was, uh, this must have been done in the, in the 80s because it was aired by Doordarshan uh, in 1992 after Nelly passed away. Um, I, I, I just feel that perhaps I have some kind of a karmic connection with Nelly, uh, Nelly's work because in, in some ways uh, it just, uh, I, I, just keep I just kept encountering it uh, over the years, uh, even when I uh, left the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the crafts department and went uh, into, into filmmaking. Uh, I went to FTI in Pune, came back and then decided to devote myself to writing on art. Uh, Nelly was always there in my, her, and her work was always there in my consciousness. And it's, it's really strange that now, uh, when I'm close to 50, uh, you know, uh, 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 I, I'm, I'm returning back to where I began with, uh, with my uh, interventions in, at, at Moorcrafts in NCPA. So I think there's some way in which we all spiral back to things that we love and things that we feel need our devotion and dedication. So uh, here is um, a glimpse into uh, my commitment to, to Nelly's practice, but also my commitment to the larger questions related to art history, the history of crafts and the history of design. And um, sorry. This is uh, a glimpse of um, the unpaved crusty earthy road uh, at Chatterjee and Lal. And um, this, uh, uh, this, this exhibition uh, is, is, is about a fiber artist who, uh, who, who also, uh, uh, who was not only uh, intensely experimental, but who also uh, performed other roles, the roles of a textile designer, um, a researcher, and also a crafts activist. And um, she, uh, I, I, I wish to present Nelly's work as a transcultural practitioner, uh, as, as somebody who was a participant in the global uh, legacy of Nordic modernism. Uh, and I would like to underline not just uh, a generic global legacy of Nordic modernism, but what I call the, the sloid inspired um, uh, uh, prehistory of Nordic modernism. So she was the inheritor of a Sloyd inspired history of prehistory of Nordic modernism, but she was also an inheritor of the ecumenical worldview of Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, which embraced both the traditional and the modern arts. And as Feroza said, this is a research driven exhibition and um, it, it, it gathers and interprets empirical evidence to propose uh, new readings uh, of, uh, of Nelly's uh, practice. Um, and, uh, and, and, and one of, one of those, uh, one of the arguments that I, I, I put forward is that we need to see um, Setna's more than three decade long career uh, through, of course, various phases, but uh, importantly, uh, we need to see it not just as um, the, the career of a solo artist, but to, to see how that career in a way culminated in the expanded, in an expanded collaborative practice, uh, which I would designate as the Nelly Setna Studio. And the Nelly Setna Studio um, uh, included uh, people from across, across the class spectrum. And I will, uh, I will return to the Nelly Setna Studio shortly. Um, here is another photograph by Sunita Raporwala, and um, it's one of my favorites because 
this is a 1984 work, and uh, you see Nelly uh, in her old age, and she is framed uh, by a crucifix on the one hand and by a martial Rajasthani puppet on the other. And the puppet is, you know, wielding its sword and it's going to mow down uh, anything that comes in the way of the dance of life. And um, uh, uh, when I was speaking to Dadi Padamji, uh, he had told me that Nelly had also made uh, a textile sculpture in the form of a crucifix. And when I saw Sunni Tarapurwala's photograph, I realized that this was the same textile sculpture. And what is really interesting about this, uh, about this sculpture is that this crucifix is swaddled in cloth. So it's almost as if uh, the, the, the crucifixion and, and, this, and, and, the, and, 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 and death and birth in a way are entwined together. Uh, there's also a certain tenderness in, in, in swaddling uh, uh, Christ's body, which is full of stigmata. And that's exactly what Nelly also did with her own body. Uh, she, uh, she, she was struck blind in 1969 um, and she lost uh, her sight for a week. And uh, by the mid seventies, she was confined to a wheelchair. Despite that, Homi and Nelly continued to travel. They, uh, uh, she, she was there for all the openings of her show. Uh, she never gave up despite all the adversities that she had to confront, even as her body wasted away slowly over the years. And that is why Nelly uh, uh, has, has inspired me, uh, of course, for her, because of her experimental practice, experimental expansive practice, but also because of who she was. And we have the puppet, uh, which you see in the photograph in the exhibition. Uh, it, it hangs from one of these gorgeous iron pillars at the at, at CNL gallery. This is just to give you a little glimpse of, uh, of, of the notes that I was making of the floor plan that I was devising for the show. And um, uh, whenever I make an exhibition, I always listen to the call of of that particular practice, what that practice is telling me. Um, I, never, I don't try to impose a certain uh, uh, mise-en-scene or scenography or thematic onto it. I listen to what the practice is telling me. And then from that, I, from there, I organically uh, in work towards um, a, a, certain, uh, a, a certain way of, of, of formulating uh, my own thoughts. When I was uh, making the floor plan, I just instinctively started making uh, these, uh, uh, these staffs uh, on the floor plan. Uh, some were perpendicular, others were parallel. And then I realized that what I was doing actually was in a way, I was mimicking the notion of weaving. I was, I was positioning the tapestries both perpendicular to the entrance of the, of the exhibition wall, uh, of, the, of the entrance wall and also parallel to the entrance wall. So this, this notion of mimicking warp and weft, uh, it, it in a way was already embedded in, in the floor plan as I was envisioning the show. And here is um, another glimpse into the show. The again, works which are both uh, parallel to the entrance wall as well as perpendicular. And it also, uh, it, it's, I've also devised it in such a way that uh, the viewer can walk through this maze, meander through it as if it's a field of tapestries. And I wanted that strong visceral experience because a lot of these um, tapestries are also like sculptures in the round. And I wanted people to go up close, to experience them, to experience the various textures and techniques that are used by Nelly. So one, one aspect of the exhibition was this visceral experience. The other aspect was this more than 20 foot, I think it is a 26 foot long wall, where I decided to uh, visualize um, all the research that I've been doing. And it's called Notes from My Research Journal. Um, th these are two parts of the exhibition and in a way uh, they both flow into each other. Uh, because uh, even as you are looking uh, in detail at one of the wall hangings, you'd like to uh, uh, look for contextual details on the research wall and, um, and vice versa. And um, 
just to say a few things about the research process. Uh, it was uh, both an exhilarating experience as, as anybody who, uh, who, who, who conducts research uh, you know, would, would, would experience, but it was also a frustrating experience because um, on the one hand, of course, there, uh, you know, I've conducted oral, oral history interviews uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and they are, of course, very, very useful. Um, they, they always, uh, in a way, um, uh, reveal uh, 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 an insightful detail, which I can then carry forward in my research. But on the other hand, I also realized that uh, people's memories of Nelly and Homi see, also seem to, in a way, accrete in cliches, in repetitions. And uh, I was told constantly that Homi was garrulous and Nelly was very quiet. But I, I, uh, I, I did not really get a sense of her work or, or her mind. Or, uh, or, 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 or a sense of what was, what was it that actually, uh, in a way, made her do what she did. Why was she preoccupied with certain kinds of aesthetic and social choices? And therefore, um, this research is a combination of, of, of course, oral history interviews, but also um, it, I decided that it would be a shame if I, if I, if I just, in a way, uh, peddle the same cliches about, about Nelly at this, at this moment in history. This retrospective felt like it, that it was, the, it was the perfect moment for me to lay the foundation of Nelly Setna's practice for the future. And um, that's exactly what I've, uh, what I've done here. So on the one hand, one gathers and interprets uh, empirical uh, evidence, but on the other hand, one also questions received narratives. And, and from that, of course, one uh, creates counter proposals, counter propositions, and, uh, and, and one, one nudges uh, in, into, into, uh, into visibility new frameworks and new readings. As I said, not just about Nelly's practice, but also uh, about um, the other disciplines, uh, which were parallel disciplines of, uh, of textile design and crafts. And um, uh, I have, in a way, uh, through exhibition ephemera, through in, uh, invitation cards, uh, uh, tr tried to create a chronology uh, of, of our practice because uh, people, uh, it's almost like the blind men of Hindustan. You know, everybody has one part of Nelly's uh, history uh, and or her career. Uh, some, some people know about her interventions in Kalamkari uh, art. Some other people know about her work in cruel embroidery. Uh, some people know about her uh, NID um, interventions, but uh, we don't have, the, what we don't have is the long arc of her practice. And that's exactly what I've attempted to do uh, in, this, in this show. Uh, alongside, uh, I've also, uh, uh, we, what we also have is apart from what I uh, what I what I mentioned earlier, which is this rare archival interview between Roshan Kalapesi and Nelly Setna. So you get to hear the artist in her own voice. I also have some really rare photographs from her travels in Iran, Turkey, Kutch. Um, so, uh, so these were mainly from the 70s. And what we also have on the research wall are, um, thanks to uh, an illustrated weekly feature by Madhumita Majumdar and some excellent photographs um, uh, uh, by Homi Setna, Mitter Bedi, and N.S. Kulkarni, uh, is a, a photo feature on the works that Nelly did when she came back from uh, Cranbrook, where she, where she studied between 58 and 59. But now I'm getting ahead of the narrative. So let, let me... Let me pull back a little bit. Um, first, I'd just like to, uh, as I said, uh, talk a little bit about, about, about these uh, tapestries themselves before I plunge into a more uh, rigorous um, uh, uh, study of, 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 of her work. And um, we have uh, Feroza Godridge with one of her favorite wall hangings on the right. Uh, and um, on the left, we have um, a, Two, two, uh, two green tapestries, and um, uh, the, the, the tapestry which, which hangs like almost like a garland, uh, it has these cascading black threads uh, and uh, with, with these gorgeous tassels below them. Uh, and this work has always intrigued me uh, because it, it, uh, it, you know, in a way, uh, you, know, you think, what, what do these cascading black threads um, connote? Is it the, the mane of an angry goddess? 
uh, or or is it uh, you, the, the, this, the, the the headgear of uh, Kathakali performers? Uh, or, uh, or 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 you you start thinking uh, is it is it part of of, of some propitiation ritual um, in of, uh, in an Indian festival? Uh, is it part of of an utsav, for instance, a sacred festivity? Because when you look at the right, for instance, you have these the, the tapestry with the arrowheads in magenta, and it looks like a festival banner. And the more I lo I looked at um, the, at Nelly's um, works from across the years, I realized that she was uh, very much influenced by uh, the, 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 the sacred diagrams, um, the sacred tantric, tantric diagrams. Uh, and uh, you, you can see, um, uh, the, uh, see a certain reference which is being made to the yantra. And, um, and, and, and as I said, it, these works also in a way evoke the sensorium of the utsav, the sacred festivity of high ritual, propitiation and procession. And um, the yantra motif, motif, in 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 this uh, in this in this photograph uh, to the to, uh, with the tapestry to the left, the yantra motif in a way gets transformed into an op art illusion, replete with Fontana style cuts. Um, in in this in this hanging, which uh, this green and orange hanging which again is apart from the Fontana incisions and the, in the optical illusion, you also have a lot of uh, textural detail um, uh, below. And um, as I started looking, uh, you know, uh, more and more of these uh, tapestries, I also realized that apart from the yantra, there, there's also the yoni motif, which, which, uh, which, which uh, in a way um, is repeated in, in, in uh, Nelly's works. And, and, and also, what you also have is uh, the the motif of the arch. So you all, you often have these concentric echoing arches in her work, and um, these these arches in a way uh, would make you think of these future of a futuristic gateway, for instance. Uh, but it uh, it could, uh, and this is a story that I was told by the collectors that it it uh, it. It, it, it's, it is supposed to, um, uh, you know, reference um, uh, the, the time when she went, um, uh, when she when she when she, when she visited New York in the 60s, and and uh, in uh, what, what you have here are these tall skyscrapers, uh, the towering blocks that she saw in New York, and then in, in the foreground you have the 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 the, the foliage of Central Park. Uh, now this is, you know, a story, and and we can, uh, you know, decide to take it on board or not. Uh, but what, what you also see along with either, you, you know, you, you can see it as, as I said, a futuristic gateway, you can see it as the towering blocks of New York. And there's a, there's a possibility that perhaps the story is right because uh, when I was researching Nelly's uh, career, I realized that she, um, she was a special delegate uh, for the first World Congress of Craftsmen and she went to New York in 1964. Um, and but also again, when you look at this tapestry, uh, I would say that these great uh, echoing arches could allude to the dense grand trees from a Kishingar painting. So I'm also finding other ways of reading her work, uh, because otherwise, when you see some of the newspaper articles or the features on Nelly's work, they take on board. Uh, things that she's repeated, which is her love for nature. Nelly would always say that design is inherent, inherent in nature. So, you know, if all the patterns that you seek uh, can be found in nature. The colors that you seek can be found in nature. And, and this is very true of her practice. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the, the fuchsias and the, the aquamarines and the sap greens in her work, um, in, in, even in the interview with uh, with Roshan Kalapesi, she talks about how, as a child, uh, she she felt intimately close to um, all uh, all of uh, nature's beings and little creatures. She talks about um, uh, seeing uh, the glittering skin that is sh shed by a snake and being fascinated by it as a child. Uh, she talks about moss and shrubbery uh, and 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 grand old trees. And, and that's and and it and it is in that little brief memoir of her childhood I found uh, the title of the show, the unpaved crusty earthy road. And uh, one of the reasons why I also chose this as my title uh, 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 is because Nelly uh, never ever walked on the paved road. 
she did not accept what what was given to her uh, she she always made her own path and uh, she she was not interested in in roads which were you know paved roads which were built on dead habits and social customs uh, she 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 i mean and i and i i think this interpretation would would you know would would be true of her work that when when you look at when you when you look at that long arc of her practice that that she she made her own road and on the right uh, we have um, Mort Mortimer Chatterjee and Tara Lal uh, in front of the echoing arches tapestry at CNL um, we have our uh, producer Ev Lemel B uh, earlier you've seen Firoza Godridge at CNL so it's also a nice way of bringing people into in, into the in, into the making of the exhibition uh, because uh, I, I just hate to just see, see, you know, to just see these sanitized long shots of, of exhibitions. In fact, if I may just share a, a little uh, side story or an adkatha, uh, when you look at uh, photographs of, of, of exhibitions that happened in the 60s and 70s, even up to the 80s, you often find that um, there, are, um, uh, you know, there, there are plants, potted plants in the exhibition, you would find that at Jahangir Art Gallery in, in, in the archival photographs. There would be, in, in Nelly's exhibition, you'd find toe trees full of, um, of dyed wool, um, balls of wool. You might find um, uh, uh, ritual objects that she collects, in, uh, you know, I mean, which, which are transported from her, uh, from her home into the gallery for the duration of the show. So uh, in this show as well, uh, and especially because it is a show which is at the intersection of fiber art, textile design, and crafts activism, um, I, I again decided that I'd, I'd put the, 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 the I'd, I'd hang the puppet also uh, in, uh, in, at CNL. And in fact, um, uh, Roshan Mullah, not Roshan Kalapesi, but Roshan Mullah, who was the chief associate of the Nelly Setna studio, uh, she, in her, in her last exhibition after Nelly passed away, uh, at the Simrosa Gallery in 2000, you, you see uh, one of these puppets uh, tied from the pillar. So I think that this is also, in a way, uh, each exhibition, in a way, carries the, the ghost images or the shadows of earlier exhibition histories. But now let me get back to the main narrative, because I'm always very happy to make a detour. I think I shared that with, with Nelly. We're all about detours and you know, constantly finding new turns. Uh, in, uh, I was talking about the, the yantra and the yoni motifs in, 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 in uh, Nelly's uh, works. And this is a beautiful um, uh, work by, um, this is a beautiful work uh, collect, which has been collected by Sue Sharma. And um, we also have, sorry to go back again, uh, the work at the left uh, has, is uh, is in the collection of uh, Gayatri and Priyam uh, Javeri. And of course, uh, most of the exhibits in uh, in, in this show um, are from uh, uh, Jamshed and Piroza Godridge's collection. And uh, the, 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 the tapestries uh, um, that we have here are from the late 60s onwards uh, to the late 80s, um, along with two works from the late 90s, which were done by Roshan Mullah, uh, Nelly's chief associate after she passed away. Uh, when, one of the things that you would also realize from um, this, uh, this snapshot of Nelly's uh, practice is that um, you, you find um, not only resonances of tantric diagrams, as I said, but also motifs from uh, the Indo-Persianate, Native American, and pre-Columbian uh, repertoires. And now I come to uh, the research wall, the, the other part uh, of, the, of, of the exhibition. Nelly Setna as a young woman. Uh, and Nelly was uh, to uh, you know, deploy this delicious Urdu word. She was bebak. Uh, she was fearless and fiercely independent. And uh, she, she, she had enrolled herself in, um, in, in the commercial arts course at JJ. Uh, she hated her teachers because they expected her to just do whatever they said without questioning. And um, uh, one of her friends, her close friends, had been demoted by the head of the commercial arts department, and she uh, protested against this. 
because she protested a, a, a little too much, the head of the department demoted her as well. Uh, and uh, of course, she was absolutely shocked uh, but, and dismayed. But she even participated in a play uh, during the annual, um, you know, I mean, during the annual college day, uh, where she, uh, where they put up a play criticizing um, uh, the, 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 this particular teacher who had demoted both Nelly and her friend. So, I mean, this is just to give you an insight into who Nelly was or what she was capable of, and um, she. she she realized that she could not continue with a commercial arts course and uh, she applied to the Regent Street Polytechnic in London. Now you must remember that Nelly was not part of the Parsi aristocracy. She belonged to a modest background and um, we, we're not sure whether um, her, her, whether uh, her mother was divorced from her father or, um, or the family was abandoned. Uh, I need to do, to do more research on this subject, but she lived with her uncle. Uh, and um, her mother uh, uh, naturally, uh, you know, had to fend for herself. Uh, she had very uh, few savings, and with some of these shares that the mother had, uh, she uh, encashed those, and uh, she, uh, you know, she embarked on a ship uh, to to sail to London. And when she went there, of course, uh, she realized that uh, she 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 had to work as well as study, and um, she started uh, because she was brilliant at embroidery. Although she had gone there to do a course in textile design and printing, she uh, she because she had the skill, um, uh, uh, she she uh, she started working for uh, the Queen's couturier, uh, Norman Hartnell, uh, who uh, uh, who act who who made the gown for Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, she would burn the candle at uh, both ends, uh, studying and and then working on embroidery uh, in the night, and she worked extremely hard and saved enough to also travel uh, in Europe. Um, so, so, I mean, again, this is another insight into Nellie's um, uh, very, very strong character, strong self-willed character. Um, as I started looking at the archival material, um, and this is um, material, uh, this, this is, um, the, uh, th these are two slides from the design magazine. Uh, and I've been going through these archives uh, 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 oftentimes because uh, it, a lot of the work that I do is at the intersection of design and craft. And um, uh, these two slides were shared with me by the photographer Ram Rehman. Um, and I thank him for that because I was looking at this missing link. Uh, whenever we start with Nellie's biography, uh, we start with uh, from the time when she went to Cranbrook in 1958-59. And uh, this, the, the, the aspect of her education in Britain uh, has, uh, has been forgotten or it's just mentioned um, au passant. But um, as I started going through certain archival material, I realized that this is a very important aspect of her career. And uh, this design magazine has, uh, on the cover of this design magazine, uh, uh, dated September 1957, you see some of Nellie's uh, designs. Uh, also on the right, uh, you, you see a few glimpses of, of the kind of design that she was doing after she came back uh, from Britain. Um, as I started looking at these uh, at these works again, you see her love for nature. You see different kinds of textures in these textile designs: dry and rough, smooth and uh, again smooth and rough. You have the dry cacti. You have stylized insects, um, and but apart from that. Uh, when I was reading uh, Veronica Hodge's article, uh, which uh, praises Nelly for these textile, for these designs, uh, and where she also talks about how wonderful it was for her to have this training in London, because uh, in, in, in a way uh, it, it helped her to get larger exposure. It, in fact, it was, it was when she was in Britain that she saw Kalamkari, for the, uh, Kalamkari fabrics for the first time at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, so, Look at seeing museums, uh, going to the theater, uh, listening to music. All of this was, in a way, um, it was it was compulsory for the students of of textile design at the Regent Street Polytechnic. And uh, Veronica Hodge, apart from praising Nelly's um, uh, uh, practice, uh, which was of course at the at the very beginning of her of her career, uh, she also talks about 
how she has she had some misgivings and she says oh uh, you know her colors are very muted and her forms are very abstract and perhaps they won't work uh, you know in a, in a situation uh, uh, you know where where, where uh, you know indian artists would, would use more brilliant hues and uh, the abstract uh, the abstraction uh, in 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 a, in, a, in a way uh, perhaps may not be um, accepted so easily uh, within the indian cultural scene um I think that Veronica Hodge, in a way, was, uh, I would say that she, she was in a, uh, imprisoned in this oriental occidental binary of, you know, what would be accepted in India and what wouldn't. Uh, she talks about how these works, in a way, remind her of Paul Clay um, and very muted tones, etc. Uh, but of course, even Paul Clay, as we know, uh, you know, I mean, he had, uh, there was a whole spectrum, uh, color spectrum in his work from uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, light pastels to brilliant hues. Um, and also what's important to remember is that uh, I would not read her, these samples of textile design from, uh, by, by saying that they, they, they in a way uh, are uh, responses to Paul Clay's work or Kandinsky's work. I think that uh, these textile samples uh, are, are in a way not responding to uh, or, or are not merely responding to the works of these painters. In fact, their origins lie elsewhere. Their origins lie in the post-World War modernist British textile design. And uh, the reason why I'm arguing this is because as I started researching further, I was looking at the 1950s and um, you have, um, uh, you, you have uh, textile designers, modernist textile designers such as um, Lucien Day, whose work is to the right. Um, you have uh, uh, Lucien Day, you also have uh, Jacqueline uh, Grogue and Marion Mahler. And uh, these were the designers in post-war Britain who were replacing the chintz inspired floral patterns, uh, fl floral prints and move from, from the pre-war period and moving towards more dynamic abstract patterns. And, um, uh, these three designers, they were, of course, influenced by Kandinsky, Clay, Miro, and Calder, but they mediated these references into popular textile patterns and um, in, into uh, making works which were, as Mahler said, and I quote, uh, radiate the works that radiated light and air, grace and pace. And it is this particular lineage of post-war textile design that 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 you that 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 you can see in Nelly's uh, works, which have been uh, uh, displayed in in the pages of the Design Magazine. And um, I mean, I'm again going making a little bit of a detour, but it's important to remember why you have these designs full of uh, light and air and grace and pace. Uh, the reason is that uh, in post-war Britain, people were tired of. Uh, of the air raids and uh, rationing, and uh, a new, there was there was a, there was a birth of a new burgeoning uh, uh, middle class, which uh, we which which wanted to decorate their own homes, and uh, the the same factories that were used to make arms and ammunition were now making uh, they were mass producing domestic goods. So what you could actually find uh, in the shops. Uh, in Britain were, um, were, were, was wallpaper glue, uh, electrical tools. So uh, in, in a way people could, uh, you, you know, I mean, through a DIY approach, start decorating their homes on their own and, and, and also do them within a certain budget. So, 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 so again, Nelly in a way is an inheritor of this affordable, elegant design. From the post uh, from the post uh, uh, war British uh, period, British textile design uh, period, and um, uh, the the reason why I also brought these uh, these these elements in in, in into play um, on the research wall is because uh, this is the inheritance that she then takes into uh, her work as a textile designer at Bombidine. And um, you have Neville Wardia, uh, who, uh, who once she came back from Britain, who invited her to lead the, the first textile design studio at Bombidine. So you're also seeing how she was a pioneer at so many levels and in, in, so, many, um, in, in, in so many fields. 
this is uh, Nelly Setna. Uh, we are now we've now moved on to uh, the the Cranbrook aspect of her career. Uh, when she uh, uh, she uh, after between fifty four and fifty six, she was in Britain. She comes back in fifty seven, and um, when she's in Bombay, she attends a lecture by Mariana Strengel, who was this Finnish American beaver uh, uh, at uh, at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, and she was visiting Bombay and. Um, Nelly went for the lecture and then she met her and she began to speak to her and told her about her plans and her ambitions and um, she wanted to study further. So uh, Mariana Strengel was very inspired by her, um, her, her personality as she, as she puts it and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and she invited her to, to come to, um, to Cranbrook uh, to uh, uh, on, on the uh, Ellen Scripps Booth Fellowship between 58 and 59. And um, in, in an oral history interview in 1982, Mariana Strengel um, you know, talks about how uh, the textile designs uh, you know, that, she would, uh, that, that she'd made um, like after uh, her course in England, uh, according to Mariana, they were not more than average. But she says, I was very impressed with her personality, as I said earlier. Um, and, um, when I read this, I was thinking again that I suspect that there is an element of a Pygmalion complex, if I may say so, at work here. Nelly, as I've shown here, had already been shaped by the post-war British textile design context. So Mariana's uh, obsession with starting all new meant that uh, Nelly could not even bring her Indian designs. Um, and as she says in her interview, she wouldn't have been allowed to do so. Um, I started her like everybody else, close quote. So Nelly goes to Cranbrook and in this uh, uh, lovely photograph, you see her uh, wearing this uh, beautiful embroidered um, uh, uh, sari, um, uh, a Parsi gara. And um, she's, she's uh, in a way posing in front of the loom and uh, at Cranbrook. And um, uh, when, when she went to Cranbrook, it's, it's very interesting because uh, she was given a fellowship to study weaving and uh, she had never uh, uh, woven before in her life and when she when she went there to the department she was just taken to her um, to her um, uh, place uh, in, in in the studio and she was asked to start weaving uh, and of course uh, she looked completely lost and um, a Finnish student Helena Perentupa came to her aid and showed her the basics of weaving and this was Nelly again. She did not go back to her dorm that night. She worked on the loom throughout the night and she was ready with a sample at the crack of dawn. And uh, she and Helena became lifelong friends. And Helena comes back into her narrative. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. This is another archival photograph. Uh, both these photographs are, um, are from the, 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 the Cranbrook Center and from the Cranbrook collection, the Cranbrook Research Center and Cranbrook uh, uh, collection and archive. And uh, in this photograph, you see, uh, you see uh, to, uh, to the left, you see Loya Saarinen, who was the head of the commercial weaving studio at, um, uh, in Cranbrook. And uh, you have in the middle, you have uh, Iro Saarinen, uh, Loya Saarinen's son, and um, at the loom, you have Mariana Strengel, Nelly's mentor and, and, and teacher. Um, Mariana Strengel, interestingly, came to America. She, she was in Finland and she visited, uh, she, she was, uh, she in a way uh, came to America to, bec to, to take on the, uh, take up the weaving department uh, in Cranbrook uh, uh, bec because, uh, Eros' father, Eliel Saarinen, uh, felt that it would be nice uh, to, to bring in uh, people with weaving traditions, especially uh, Scandinavian and Nordic traditions, to the Cranbrook Academy. And um, uh, uh, Mariana first came on a visit, and then she uh, loved the place and decided to take up, the, uh, take up weaving, and, uh, and, and, she, and she taught there. Uh, now, Maria, Mariana uh, took over the weaving department from Lohia Sarinen. Lohia's um, commercial weaving studio uh, uh, made, 
uh, draperies and home furnishings um, for individuals, but also uh, for, uh, for, uh, for architects and interior designers. Um, in fact, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of their, um, uh, was, was one of their uh, clients. And um, uh, uh, Loya uh, made, uh, made, made the, uh, she made the designs and so did uh, uh, Eliel Saarinen, as well as uh, Mahaya um, Anderson Birda. And um, there were Swedish weavers who then wove uh, to these textile designs uh, conceptualized by Lohia and Maya and Elil Saarinen. And what is really interesting is that as I was researching uh, this more particular moment in history, um, uh, I came across this incident um, at the Lohia um, Saarinen studio where um, uh, Ruth Ingwassen and Lillian Holm, who were the two Swedish weavers at the studio, they were feeling uncomfortable because they felt that they had not been properly acknowledged that their work had not been properly acknowledged by these designers. And in a way, the designers would get all the credit, but not the people who actually wove to these designs. And uh, the, uh, one day, um, uh, this conflict uh, reached a flashpoint. And, um, and, 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 uh, and they said that uh, they would stop work unless they were given proper acknowledgement. And this was for, um, they, they were weaving this monumental um, uh, uh, wall hanging, which was called, uh, uh, which was the, uh, the, uh, the weaving for the Indiana church, uh, which was designed by Eliel Saarinen in the forties. And um, of course this, this church, uh, you know, I mean, the motto of this church was all about um, uh, worshipfulness and obedience. And I, I thought it was really ironic that the, the wall hanging uh, uh, for, for this particular church, church in a way was made uh, in, in, in a very different kind uh, of situation. It was made uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a situation which was full of um, conflict and disobedience. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and um, uh, and 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 I and I decided to add this aspect also to to the archival uh, research wall because I wanted to talk about uh, in in a way what collaborative what the collaborative practice in a weaving studio entails what happens to the question of acknowledgement uh, what what happens to uh, people uh, from diff from 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 different uh, parts of uh, you know of, of society from 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 across the class spectrum when they come together and they're working designers and weavers uh, uh, the 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 question of who gets the credit and whether somebody gets acknowledged properly or not. These questions are questions that I will then pick up later uh, in, in the lecture when I talk about the Nelly Setna studio. And um, I'd now uh, like to uh, move on to uh, the first work that the first exhibition, I think this is one of the first exhibitions because I haven't found uh, exhibi exhibition uh, invites uh, before this, but it seemed like the first exhibition because she comes back, she, her course was between 58 and 59. So this is an exhibition invite from 1960. And um, this is as, as the invite tells you, uh, it's, it's hand printed and hand woven um, works by Nelly Setna. It was shown in, uh, in, uh, on 23rd May at the Jahangir Art Gallery in 1960 and um, what you see on the on on the um, on, on the front of this invitation card uh, is a very interesting tableau of stylized figures and um, and I um, and and when you when you look at these uh, figures for instance uh, you uh, you realize that you know I mean there, there, there seem to be um, toilers but also um, uh, layabouts um, you know uh, and 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 um, and maybe some uh, also uh, perhaps uh, some, some peasants and shepherds, um, but you're not very sure. And then you look at the title of this of this work, and it says uh, "Classmates at Cranbrook, uh, USA." And um, uh, and and this title is 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 a very interesting insight into this work. Um, it's uh, it's dated um, uh, 1960, and um, we uh, we we we. This, this particular tapestry, where, which is made out of cotton warp with wool and rayon on the weft, um, it, 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 in a way, on the one hand, it has these uh, stylized figures, um, which might make you think of peasantry, 
uh, or, or, um, or, 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 of, or, or, or of the laboring body. But on the other hand, it, it also makes you think of uh, the, 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 the characters in, in, in uh, Nelly's class at Cranbrook. Uh, you think of, uh, of you know, maybe uh, perhaps there was a student who, who was a layabout or somebody who was very hardworking. Uh, we will never be able to solve this mystery because we, of course, uh, don't have um, you know, anything to go by, uh, at least for now, in terms of interpreting this work. But as I did further research, I realized that actually these stylized figures are from block printed circular placemats, which were made by Eero Sarinen when he was, a when he was just 10 years old in 1920. And uh, these uh, Placemats. I found them because they are at the Saarinen House on the Cranbrook campus, uh, and the, the Saarinen House was, as 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 was much of the Cranbrook uh, ca Academy campus, was designed by Eliel Saarinen, and it was a, guess, a Gesamtkunst work or a total work of art. And here, in one of these placements, I found these stylized figures of Nelly, and. Um, uh, uh, Shelley Salim points out e that Eros figures of these toiling workers and vagabonds punctuated by a king and a Finnish flag uh, may allude to Finland's struggle for independence against the Russians and the Swedes before that. Now Shelley Salim is talking about the circular placemats made by Eero at the age of 10 in 1920. But those placemats, because of their circular form, they are, they in a way, are about a repetitive cycle of life, labor, and death. But what Nelly has done in this tapestry is something very different. This is a horizontal work. So in a way, it, uh, it, 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 in a way it sort of inspires horizontal communication. And, um, and also, uh, nobody is bowing and scraping in this particular tableau uh, as against the circular placemat. Uh, what you have here are people who are erect, uh, they, 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 the, the, and, and, and you could read these figures uh, as idi idiosyncratic figures. Uh, the head of one of these figures could be on fire. Another one could have, uh, a figure could have crucified itself. Yet another figure takes on the role of a shepherd. Maybe these are some of the qualities of some of the students at Cranbrook, perhaps. I'm just speculating. But again, this is one way of showing how uh, through, um, through empirical evidence, uh, we are able to also see how Nelly mediated the influences and the so various sources of Nordic modernism into her work. And um, what we have here um, is, uh, is Nelly um, uh, at the loom. And this is part of uh, the Illustrated Weekly uh, article uh, from nine, uh, uh, which was uh, authored by Madhumita Mojumdar and um, uh, which, as I said earlier, and this was a feature on Nelly for the Illustrated Weekly, uh, uh, which was brought out in 1968. Uh, so this is just uh, around less than a decade after Nelly has come back. And you can see this intense experimentation that she has emb embarked on in, in, in this decade after she comes back from Cranbrook. And on the right, you have the Illustrated Weekly um, magazine, uh, the cover of it, which has one of Nelly's uh, wall hangings, which is nine foot long. It's a wall hanging for, the, for, for Air India, which is based on um, a Rajput miniature. So it's a reproduction of the Rajput miniature. But what you see on the left here is actually a treble weave. And it is uh, a textile mobile. And it, uh, it's woven in colored wool with lurex and wire, both for glitter. Uh, and I would call it this uh, lurex is a kind of post-World War jari. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but also the, 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 the wire also helps with keeping the work firm. And um, it's a treble weave with, which, which leaves the six sides free um, and, and uh, it's joint at the center. Um, so this is again a, a long, six foot six foot long uh, textile mobile. So you can see that not only was she experimenting with materials and techniques, but she was also uh, experimenting with scale. Uh, what you have here is this latticed uh, room divider and it's in jute warp and jute and uh, sisal weft. Um, and um, on the right, you have a Spanish, uh, a room divider and Spanish weave. Uh, 
which, which has used cotton rope in the weft. Um, people who are familiar with Annie Albers's uh, room dividers and, and screens uh, would clearly see uh, the influence of Annie on, on, on this particular work. Uh, you also have um, on the left here, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a rug or a carpet, and it has this uh, pile, um, and uh, and and the pile is is made to look as if it is um, to, to give it a kind of stained glass effect, uh, and um, on the right we have um, this very elegant uh, double weave. Um, we also have here. Uh, on, on, on the left, we have um, a Spanish weave. And um, what you can see at the, um, uh, at the center, uh, you have this, um, this, this texture of a chatai, because what she's used is reed straw. And we are all familiar in India with the chatai uh, as a material. So uh, we, we find them in our homes. Uh, and also in our window blinds and so forth. So I think, again, uh, what, what we are uh, um, what you're also seeing is how uh, she she was constantly experimenting where she was using jute and sisal and cotton and wool, um, unbleached cotton, strips of leather. Um, she was using also uh, nylon and rayon. Uh, she was working on with scale. On the right, you see uh, Nelly and Rhoda Gusler working on this large um, uh, crochet work. And she also, not, not only was she, um, not only did she deploy uh, on-loom techniques in her work, uh, but she also uh, deployed off-loom techniques. So she was working with macrame. So a work she would, you know, from a bamboo, she would start, uh, you know, make, hand knotting uh, these jute twines. And then she would move on to uh, making, uh, uh, you know, the, the rest of the, of the room divider in crochet. So, uh, so, the, so the same work could have macrame and crochet. Um, the same work could have uh, indigenous materials, but also industrial ones, um, and so forth. So you can see this crazy burst of experimentation in the 60s. 69 is when she, for a week, she loses a sight, as I said. Um, and um, in the 70s, um, you have her um, working with, forgive me. In the 70s, you work. You have her working with um, with public commission, working on public commissions. And um, uh, on the left, you have a photograph which has been popularized by the photographer and uh, photographic curator Ram Rahman. It's a photograph by um, uh, by Madam Bhata. And uh, you can see Madan Mahata's shoes on 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 the in 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 the in in, in the foreground, and because she, he's taking a photograph of the stairwell of the Ford Foundation, uh, which was um, designed by Joseph Allen Stein, who you see walking up the stairs. And this is a photograph which uh, Ram has shown um, often in his lectures, and it's it's a fantastic photograph of this stunning staircase that was designed by Joseph Allen Stein. Now Joseph Allen Stein and um, Nelly Setna were both. Alumni, um, alumni of, the, of, of, of Cranbrook. So here there's already a connection. And it was, uh, uh, and it was uh, Stein who invited her to uh, work both on the Express Stars, um, uh, uh, the, the lobby of the Express Stars, which I'll come to, and also um, uh, to, to contribute for, uh, for furnishings as well as, um, um, uh, as, well as uh, wall hangings um, and carpets uh, for the Ford Foundation. And, um, while we were all familiar with the photograph on the left, um, uh, I realized that there was uh, something uh, that 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 uh, while you have this uh, this uh, this aerial view of the staircase uh, to the top right at uh, the top right hand corner, uh, there is a wall hanging. And in 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 something that Homi uh, talked about, he said that uh, Delhi had made a wall hanging, um, you know, which 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 in which in a way uh, was 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 hung across the three storied um, building of. Of Ford Foundation. And um, so I decided to ask Pavan Mata, Madan Mata's son, uh, if he could go through the uh, Madan Mata's archive and if he could give me a better shot, a better, uh, you know, more detailed view of this particular wall hanging. And um, uh, this, this work has never been exhibited before, so he found it in the negative wallet. And according to him, it may be from 1969. And uh, you, what you can, what you see here is what is most likely Nelly Setna's uh, wall hanging because it has this organic geometry from her 1960s work. 
so these are also some of the um, fun elements of when you when you are researching. Um, you know, as we keep zooming into things, things that we think are very familiar to us, we relook at them and find new treasures. Um, The next work that I'd like to show, and I'm not showing you the panoramic view of this uh, large tapestry, site-specific tapestry in, uh, installation at the Godrej Bhavan, because the details can't really be seen on the screen. So I'm showing you two details from this uh, tapestry uh, installation. And um, uh, th th this was, again, a public uh, commission from the early 70s. Uh, it was for a building designed by Zal Gobai, um, the, and it's called the Godrej Bhavan. And, um, Again, in this tapestry installation, what you what you see are details like the spiral um, and this concentric quadrilateral. And the spiral could remind you of the Konarak um, chariot of time, uh, or, or it could also uh, make you uh, put you in mind of, uh, of the, the spirals of the, the leaf venations um, uh, or uh, or seashells from nature and the the other detail that I've picked out from the tapestry installation is um, is these concentric quadrilaterals because you can see uh, Joseph Alba's uh, 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 recessional and projective planes, how she's using that uh, in, in her work. So this is clearly a reference to um, Alba's uh, chromatics, the push-pull chromatics. And of course, uh, this was a work which was being made for um, for um, uh, for 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 uh, for an uh, for for a corporate house, so the, the wheel in a way also could refer to uh, industrial progress. Uh, this is um, the Express Stars, the, the lobby of the Express Stars. Again, we have some beautiful shots taken by Anil Rani, which we'll be using, uh, which we will be using in the book. But uh, for 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 now, uh, what I've done, what I've picked out are details because they'll help you to see it uh, more clearly, and. Uh, in this uh, immersive lobby of the Express Stars, uh, you, uh, you 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 actually uh, in a way uh, you, you are you're almost led uh, from 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 the lobby uh, through a, through a circular sweep across um, the elevator area and then into uh, in, in, into a, a larger expanse, which as you can see on the right uh, again is influenced by Albers's squares or gateways. And um, on the left, again, you see the echoing arches, which I was talking about earlier. Uh, again, you could think of them as futuristic gateways, but also you must remember that this was a building which was designed by Joseph Allen Stein. It was the first skyscraper uh, built on reclaimed land in Nariman Point. So, you, so it's also in a way that history is also encoded into this tapestry um, installation and uh, not the tapestry installation, forgive me. This is cer this, these are ceramic murals, but I said tapestry inst installation because when I look at these ceramic murals and the way they are being designed, they almost look like weaves. So that, that could also be one of the kind of you know, cross connection between the weave and the ceramic mural. And uh, Al Alan Stein, um, uh, uh, this was the first skyscraper in South Asia in, in its own day, in the early 70s. Uh, and of course, as I said, Alan Stein invited Nelly uh, and there were also uh, other connections that brought them together because of their Cranbrook um, uh, pedagogical background. Um, again, when, when you are in this Express Stars, and I've had so many people come to me, they have worked at the Express Stars for many decades, and they don't know that actually the lobby that they used to pass through on a daily basis, that lobby has ceramic murals by Nelly Setna. So, so again, when, when I say that she's an all but forgotten artist, it is true. Uh, her work is known to a certain generation of collectors. Um, and people who knew them, but otherwise, um, even people who worked in the Express Stars did not know that 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 they were actually passing through uh, Nelly's work on a daily basis. And um, uh, when when you are in this uh, lobby of the Express Stars, you almost feel as if you are swirling in an ocean, and you have these sap greens and aquamarines and turquoise and cerulean uh, shades uh, of these glazed ceramic tiles. Um, uh, before I uh, move on to the 70s, uh, I'd like to take you back um, to, um, to, to, 19, um, to 1965. And um, uh, this is the time when Gira, Gira Sarabhai um, 
invited uh, Nelly Setna uh, to come in as a textile design consultant um, at NID. And um, the NID book, uh, which is a wonderful uh, work of reference, talks about how uh, she said uh, uh, Nelly, at the invitation of Gira Sarabai, who was the co-founder of NID, set up a small modest workshop uh, with a Leclerc uh, loom. Um, uh, which she had brought from the US and many other small and larger looms. And she also had a screen printing um, a table, a dyeing unit, a library, so that the students could uh, look at uh, the works of other textile designers and weavers. And uh, uh, of course, uh, she, Nelly could not have uh, stayed uh, in Ahmedabad for a long time. And therefore, um, uh, she uh, recommended to uh, Gida Sarabai that she, she could invite Helena Perintupa, her friend from Cranbrook, to come and uh, you know, take over the, the, the textile design course at an ID. And uh, that's how uh, Helena Perintupa, who had taught, her, taught Nelly the basics of, uh, of weaving, comes to an ID in the late 60s. And then the, the, two, the two of them together um, uh, put, put, in, um, uh, put together the foundations of what would become the textile design course. And um, uh, this is again uh, very interesting because uh, what you see here at NID uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the, what I what I in, at the introduction in the, during the introduction talked about the the, the Sloyd inspired prehistory of Nordic, Nordic modernism. So that's the heritage that um, that that Nelly and Helena in a way have imbibed from Cranbrook, and that is what they actually brought to the textile design course at NID. Now. Um, let me explain what I mean by the Sloyd inspired prehistory of Nordic modernism. So um, let us go back to uh, Mariana Strengel and uh, we to Cranbrook, Mariana Strengel at the loom, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 Loya Sarinen studio, the the weavers, um, most of the people, most of these uh, people at the weaving department, um, uh, also the architect uh, and some of the designers, they were they were all um, uh, either they were all Scandinavians, they were either Finnish or or Swedish, and. Um, it, uh, when I um, when I was when I was. Uh, uh, our, uh, when I was researching um, her, her uh, Nelly Scranbrook phrase, um, uh, I realized that uh, Nordic modernism is just sort of used as a kind of catch-all term, uh, and then uh, you know, it is, and then uh, people quickly move from from that term into just giving the basic details of what Nelly uh, uh, was doing at Cranbrook. But I, I realized that, 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 that we need to, in a way, critically uh, annotate this term Nordic modernism. It's not just a generic modernism that Nelly and uh, Loya Saarinen and, uh, and, and Eliel and Nero and Mariana are inheritors of. Um, uh, uh, so the reason I call it the Sloyd inspired uh, Nordic modernism is because uh, Sloyd is a, is 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 a, is a, is 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 is, is a, uh, it's it's actually a handicraft based system, and it was uh, inaugurated in the late nineteenth century by um, uh, uh, by uh, by Uno Signius uh, in Finland and uh, Otto Solomon uh, in, in 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 Sweden, and. Um, this uh, Sloyd based handicraft system is part of the state pedagogy where uh, students are taught from, from childhood in school, they're taught to, to, you know, they're taught how to weave and embroider, uh, they're taught metalwork and woodwork. And uh, therefore, uh, the, 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 they are already initiated into the artisanal traditions, they are acquainted with the different materials and techniques. And also, they are uh, in a way invited to experiment with these materials and techniques. Now, um, uh, what what you actually when when, uh, when 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 I realized through the oral history interviews given by Mariana Strengel in the 1980s that that uh, that Mariana was. Um, that Mariana would not allow any of her students, regardless of whether they were Indians or they were they were Finnish students or Americans, she did not allow them to uh, look at Native American art or pre-Columbian art uh, or Indian art or Indian art or textile design. She wanted them to start on a tabula rasa, a blank state, blank slate, and the reason for this was because uh, she, 
it was very important for her. She'd say, don't copy um, the, the First Nation people's uh, textile repertoire. Uh, don't copy um, Nordic designs. Uh, it was this modernist impulse where you had to break away from the past and start all new. And um, therefore, um, people who would then, in, in, uh, historians, you know, if they, if they were to, in a way, uh, read the artistry uh, from, 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 what, from, from Mariana Stengel's rhetoric, then uh, you would think that this is what Nelly inherited. But actually, I would argue that what Nelly inherited was not just not just the rhetoric of Mariana Strengel, which was, a, which was a modernist rhetoric to break from the past, but what she had actually inherited and which was in the practice of Mariana Strengel, but not, the rhetor not her rhetoric. Her rhetoric was all about, uh, it almost sounded like John uh, Dewey, the pragmatist uh, philosopher, being self-made and so forth. But uh, her, her, what she actually in a way imparted was this Lloyd inspired ethic of Nordic modernism of experimentation, um, of, of, uh, of, of, of experimenting with artisanal uh, traditions, of, of having a, a very clear grasp on techniques and materials. And already uh, uh, when Mariana took over the uh, Loya Sarinen studio, she had moved from uh, uh, Loya Sarinen's ways of teaching, which was more uh, uh, weaving, which was more rep representational design to a more pattern-based abstraction that, that Mariana favored. And uh, so, so it is this Sloyd inspired Nordic modernism that in a way Nelly becomes um, an in inheritor of. And, uh, and, so, and so does uh, Helena, this is my argument. Uh, but when I was, for instance, uh, reading uh, uh, in the NID book, uh, Homi Setna's account of Nelly's uh, practice, especially her interface with uh, NID uh, in, the, in, the, in the 60s, um, I came upon uh, this very interesting um, passage where uh, Homi talks about how, uh, how uh, it, you know, Nelly uh, earlier was uh, basically uh, very much influenced by Nordic design. And then later on, when she came to NID and she started traveling to Gujarat and Rajasthan, uh, she brought Indian color and forms and designs into her work. And all of this is true. She was influenced by Nordic design. She was also, in, you know, be, in a way being bombarded by external stimuli of color and forms. Uh, but uh, I would again like to argue, and this is very important art, at an art historical level, that, uh, you know, when we start, uh, looking at an artist's practice uh, in this way, where we, uh, in a way, uh, our reading of it is, is more, uh, is, is, is prejudiced and in, in a way it's colored by rhetoric, rather than looking at what is actually happening in the practice, then we are often misled. And one of the reigning rhetorics of the day, which in a way could mis mislead our understanding of Nelly's work from the 60s, uh, when she came back from Cranbrook is the rhetoric of Indianness. And because Homi was a filmmaker, he made several, fil several films for, F for the films division, uh, which of course, as we know, um, uh, it, was, it was basically films which didactic documentaries, which were meant to propagate, propagate the state, the, the message of the Indian state. And it also in a way uh, came out of a kind of Nehruvian top-down development um, approach. Of course, there were also filmmakers who then transgressed the boundaries of that, uh, of that uh, uh, state rhetoric, but I'm not going into that. I could do another lecture on that. So, uh, so, so, so you can also see that, that often Homi spoke uh, on behalf of Nelly, um, and, um, uh, which was also natural because they were companions, comrades. Um, uh, uh, Homi was also in a way the manager of, of, of Nelly Setna's studio. Uh, and also, um, uh, uh, he was also a friend, uh, a fellow conversationist on, uh, on, on questions related to craft and design. Uh, but I think that his, his, he, he was as much, he was also colored by this whole Indianness rhetoric, uh, which in a way he was projecting onto Nelly's work. And when you actually look at Nelly's work, and then I found another very interesting insight uh, in, in, in one of uh, Mariana Strengel's oral history interview, where en passant, she's talking about how Nelly uh, had made this beautiful black and white double weave, which according to her is extremely uh, difficult and tricky because it's black and white and, um, it, it, and, 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 and the fact that she actually made it uh, in, in a brilliant manner, it was perfect according to Mariana, um, that 
then made me think about how and and Mariana also says that when the interviewer asked her did you ask him to ask Nelly to work in neutral colors and she said no they were allowed to work in whatever fashion they wanted and so it made me realize that this that that we also that we should not just look at what the external stimuli or the rhetoric in a way that envelops an artist's practice we must also look at the evidence of the practice itself so and 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 because i had have just co-curated uh, melly uh, gobai's retrospective don't ask me about color uh, uh, during the lockdown uh, before before the lockdown uh, I was anyways immersed in these questions related to what does it mean for an artist to renounce color? What does it mean to, uh, you know, in a way uh, to, to, to work with the seductions of color? Uh, and and uh, so, so again, I think what Nelly was working uh, in, in this double weave was with this notion of push-pull, uh, and uh, which again is something that perhaps she was in, uh, must have been inspired by um, Albers, uh, Joseph Albers chromatics. And, uh, so, so what is important is to, to, to remember that there is an inner directed logic of an artist's practice. And that uh, is something that uh, an artist like Nelly Setna, regardless of what that rhetoric was, or regardless of the fact that she herself participated in that rhetoric later in her, in, in, in her practice, uh, that, that there is evidence in the practice which, which shows you how her work developed. And, and therefore, the, the the, the rhetoric that comes from outside, its projections and its limitations versus what is actually happening within the work. Um, and I think that this is also in a way, perhaps it, it is like a lesson for students of art history, textile design and the crafts as well. Um, I was talking about this Sloyd inspired Nordic modernism heritage that in a way feeds into the textile design course of uh, NID. But, uh, and I again uh, made a little bit of a detour and I will very quickly uh, talk about this, is that, um, uh, that when we talk about uh, the, the history of modern design in post-independence India, we of course begin our narrative with NID and correctly so. But in my research, I found out that there were Sloyd um, trained designers who had come to Shanti Niketan uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, they had actually um, worked with um, the, the local villagers um, and the designers at Sri Niketan, which was the rural construction rural construction program uh, started by uh, Rabindranath Tagore. In a way, it was um, it was it, it was like a companion school to uh, Shanti Niketan. But in this in, in Sri Niketan, he was looking at the you know, towards the welfare of the local villagers, trying to make them uh, independent and self sufficient, uh, helping them to acquaint themselves with uh, new techniques look for market opportunities. And in this particular task, um, he was uh, uh, helped by Ratindranath Tagore. So, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm again, just finding new ways of telling uh, art history, but also the history of design. Um, and I mean, I'm hoping that this in a way would, would become uh, some kind of a foundation for, for other people to take forward. And I know that I'm like a Kabir Panti, I'm weaving in and out of my lecture slides. I had a perfect lecture, but somehow I can never do anything in a linear fashion. So here I am sort of, you know, going back and forward, but I suppose it is uh, perfectly appropriate for a, a, a lecture on weaving. And of course, a lecture, a lecture which, uh, you know, whose retrospective is titled The Unpaved Crusty Earthy Road, a road full of detours. So I come to the seventies now, and in the 70s, what we have here is, um, the, uh, is, is an invitation uh, from the International Music and Arts Society, which is presenting an exhibition of Kalamkari, uh, which is basically Kalamkari designs uh, by, uh, by, by Nelly. And uh, it was shown at the, uh, the, the Venkatapa Art Gallery um, in, in Bangalore in 1978. And um, on, on the right, what we have is um, an, an invitation um, of um, cruel embroidery 
And um, this was in 1970, in the late 1970s. And uh, it was an exhibition of cruel embroidery, which um, uh, where um, Nelly was again showing the new design layouts that she had done for cruel embroidery uh, um, uh, in Kashmir, which 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 which, which is um, which which is famous in Kashmir, and um, and um, this was an exhibition which took place at the Jahangir Art Gallery uh, in 1979. Now. Um, the reason to show this exhibition in white uh, ephemera here is uh, to, 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 to talk about the 1970s aspect of Nelly's career. So she is in the 60s, she's come back and she's into this intense experimentation. 69, she's already has the first inklings of her, uh, of, of, what, of what was going to ha uh, happen to, her, um, to her, her body and how it would slowly give up on her. Uh, by mid 70s, she is uh, in a wheelchair, but already early 70s, she has, uh, she has, she has, uh, she has been invited to do these large scale public commissions, which I already showed you earlier. And uh, so that's the first phase from the 60s to around mid 70s. And then from the 70s, early 70s, mid 70s to the 80s. Now in the 70s, the second phase, as I see it, and this phase is where uh, she, um, she's already by, by the late 60s, so after a decade of working at Bombay Dying, she leaves Bombay Dying, the textile design studio, and then she uh, uh, she's invited uh, to, she's she's given a Homi Bhabha, Homi Bhabha Fellowship in 1972. And between 1972 and 74, she starts traveling. Um, she um, she goes to Masabi Patnam and Kalahasti, and she uh, starts making new design layouts for Kalamkari fabrics. And um, she, what she does is that she goes into um, these uh, old go-downs where uh, she finds old blocks and also uh, the house, the hutments of, uh, of, 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 of artisans. And um, these are all abandoned uh, blocks, which nobody uh, had taken care of and which perhaps in a way uh, had become obsolete for the people uh, living in, the, in those areas. And um, this, uh, when she went to Maslipatnam and uh, she, she worked for a cooperative society where people were extremely poor. And um, on Kamala Devi's uh, Chattapadhyay's in, uh, invitation, she, uh, she made these new layouts, which would uh, in a way speak to the contemporary sensibility. Uh, but what she was doing is that when she was making these new design layouts, she was working with old blocks, old blocks that she was um, researching and uh, finding in, in areas that had been abandoned. And with these old blocks, what she, what she did was that she uh, made new designs such that, and here I'd like to quote uh, Yashodra Dalmia, who talks about how, you know, with, with uh, these in these Mastilipatnam, uh, uh, you know, Kalamkari fabrics, what you have is that you have the the, the and, I, and I quote her the square frontality of the masjid. So th that somehow is 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 almost a kind of uh, a feature of uh, and uh, it's, it's it's a feature which then in a way becomes part of these uh, uh, Kalamkari fabrics, a kind of central feature. So that feature, you know, in a way gets reflected in these uh, Kalamkaris which were being made post independence, and um, and Nelly wanted to move away from this this notion of um, of a central feature, uh, and and she wanted. To in a way create a field where you wouldn't have a kind of sovereign vantage point. Instead, you would be able to um, weave in and out, uh, or um, to, to um, uh, weave in and out is a mixed metaphor because these are um, painted and printed uh, fabrics. But but to be able to uh, to 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 in a way um, move in and out of uh, horizontal and vertical bands um, of. Um, uh, of, 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 of these printed blocks. And, um, and, and uh, Firoza Godrich has some of these uh, Kalamkari uh, bed sheets that Nelly had designed, and they're absolutely beautiful. She used muted shades. And um, it, again, because she allowed them to play out as a field, uh, you, you have the sense of um, a, a sense of freedom when you look at them. Uh, you have a sense of expanse, of, of a landscape, uh, rather than uh, being hemmed into a certain kind of, uh, the, of, of a customary or a social or a divine relationship with, uh, uh, with, with, with God or with the patron. And um, she did the same thing again with cruel embroidery as well. And in fact, um, uh, she, she did two books. Uh, one was uh, on Kalamkari in 1985. And this was uh, illustrated uh, by the book, the, the designs, Nelly Setna's um, new design layouts were illustrated by Roshan Mullah, her chief associate. 
and also Roshan also illustrated uh, the new design layouts of the cruel embroidery book, which was called Shal, Weaves and Embroideries of Kashmir. This book came, uh, came out before the Kalamkari book uh, in, the in 1985. The, uh, this book came out in 1973. And again, you see her, uh, her empathy for uh, the, the artisans in Kashmir and, 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 and the conditions in which they, uh, they work. There's a beautiful passage there, which I leave you to read uh, in, in, the, in, the in the exhibition, which is, which, is from, which is from her shawl book, which I've quoted. So we put up these iPads where you, see, where you have these video flip throughs of the entire book. But these are again, archival documents. We don't really find them much. Uh, on eBay, they cost a few lakhs or something. So uh, th these are again, uh, books which perhaps the new generation uh, would love to acquaint themselves with. Um, well, on the right, we of course have uh, this beautiful portrait of Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. And uh, one of the arguments that I uh, make in the exhibition again is that on the one hand, of course, uh, Nelly was empowering uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the artists of this cooperative society by, uh, uh, by designing new layouts for them uh, so that uh, they could work on these new layouts, earn a livelihood, um, earn back their dignity. But on the other hand, uh, I would say that Nelly Satna was also a product of what I call the maternalistic approach, a maternalistic approach, which was very much also something that is that I would that I would associate with Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jaikar, because uh, and I'm just brutally sort of um, you know sort of making a synopsis of this argument is that uh, that even while they were able to uh, in, uh, even while the craftspeople were able to exert their own uh, agency and their subjectivity through the design interventions of Nelly and uh, the activism of, um, of Kamla Devi and, um, and Pupul, uh, they, they, they still, in a way, their, their subjectivity, their agency was subsumed within the personality cult of um, the elite designers and crafts activists. And I, think, and I think that this is something that we need to also think about. I mean, of course, for me, this question of agency has been something that has been central to my thinking from the time when I was in my 20s and uh, when I was working at the craft center in NCPA. So uh, this question is, uh, is of great importance to me and I think should also be of great importance to uh, across the generations because this question has not gone away. Um, this is uh, just to show you um, the, the, the video of uh, Nelly Setna when she's talking to Roshan Kalapesi of Paramparik Karigar. And I now move on to the 1980s. I'm brutally editing the show because of course, otherwise we'd be here till midnight. Uh, and whatever I do, I somehow I'm not able to uh, sort of, you know, keep it, keep it short. So please forgive me for that. Um, and, um, in the 80s, and this is again a very important exhibition invite uh, from the 80s, and, it, and this, this invite is of historic importance because uh, I have in a way prepared you for the debate about the, 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 the collaborative impulses of uh, a weaving studio uh, by talking about how uh, Lillian Holm and Ruth Ingwasen fight for their credit in the Loya Saarinen studio. Um, and um, your, um, I, I, I I'm showing you an invite where Nelly Setna, this was an invite in 1984 uh, for the Lalitkara Academy in Delhi. And she, uh, she talks about, she, she acknowledges all the people um, who, who, have, uh, who have helped her in the making of this exhibition. And she, uh, and she says, you are invited to see the hand-woven, handcrafted experiments and creations of my associates are Mochi Bhanu, the shoemaker, whose leather hangings and screens hang here, our domestic help Chandrabhaga, whose deft hands shredded the beads, Mani, the helpmate, re recently come from a village making hangings out of articles used daily in the village, like the udan and the basket, our all, jo our all jobs man, Man Singh, who helps us to lay the warp, and true to, to his appellation, does all the jobs. And Roshan, Roshan Mullah, my right hand in everything, the Roshni that glimmers in all the works here, and, and, and Homi, the, the real force behind the show. 
and it's signed Nelly Setna. And I think this is very, very important because this is a historic document because the, 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 the question of, of, of acknowledgement, the politics of acknowledgement at the heart of collaborative in interventions is a question that has not gone away, as I said, and it actually has become even more serious in our times because of the increasing socioeconomic asymmetries. So here you have a fiber artist, a weaver, who acknowledges all the associates of the studio. And I would also, I'm not going to go back right to the earlier slide, but if you remember with a visual recall, uh, she was not just uh, acknowledging her associates now because you know by the mid seventies she had been confined to a wheelchair. Uh, she was also acknowledging her associates when she was in her sixties. This is before uh, multiple sclerosis uh, struck, her, struck her body. Uh, in the Illustrated Weekly article, you find her and her, uh, sister, who is also named, and, and, other, and other people who are named who, who were part of, uh, uh, of, of her studio. So I think that uh, this, this, uh, this, the way in which she created this, she crafted a kind of solidarity of talent, uh, you know, with, with people across the spectrum. This also gives you an insight into who Nelly Setna was. Um, so, so from the 60s, intense experimentation to the 70s, as I said, 70s is a moment of crafts revival, new design layouts, um, 80s, uh, she goes back to, uh, to, to, to having her exhibitions, uh, her own solos, along with her associates. And, um, uh, and, and even when she was uh, confined to a wheelchair, she was traveling, she was there for, uh, for all her uh, exhibition openings, even the last exhibition in 1992 at the Jahangir Art Gallery, she's there. Uh, she, she, she traveled along with Homi. Um, the, they, they, uh, and and whatever, hap whatever was happening slowly to her body, uh, she did not uh, let that uh, get in the way of, of, of her uh, hard work her imagination. She had her own small room that she worked on and she designed all the wall hangings um, during her own lifetime. Um, and as she became more and more debilitated, uh, it was Roshan uh, Mullah, who then, because I, I find it in the exhibition invites, uh, till, until the late 80s, uh, she is, uh, she's, uh, she is uh, acknowledged as her associate and, um, and it, the invites say that she designed, she, she weaves through the designs of Nelly Setna, but slowly uh, uh, in, the, in, the la in the last invite, the one before uh, Nelly passed away in 1992, the Jangirat Gallery, Gallery exhibition, you see that she's called the chief designer and weaver. So uh, this is also, I mean, you, you, can, you can see, I mean, uh, how slowly, uh, you know, Roshan then gets, uh, gets more of a role uh, in also uh, making her own tapestries. And then she can, Roshan continued to make tapestries. Uh, she had two shows, one in 1997 at the Jahangir Art Gallery and one in 2000 at the Simrosa Art Gallery after Nelly passed away. Um, Roshan would also sometimes, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, um, weaving uh, ma magazines on weaving and on design, and um, uh, she would then, you know, talk to Nelly, and then sometimes they would work together on design. So in the main, it was Nelly's own designs that she she did the, uh, that she wove to, but they would also sometimes collaborate on something that uh, that that Roshan had put forward. So this was their this was their relationship. This is what uh, I was told by Roshan when I when I met her. Uh, it was extremely difficult to get an appointment with Roshan because she's a recluse, and um, and also I had to be very sensitive because. Uh, for, for Roshan, this is the, a closed chapter of her life. And it was also a very difficult life in that sense, a life full of, um, of, um, of a life full of, um, of experimentation and, and, um, and, and, um, and imagination, uh, working with her uh, mentor, Nelly Setna, because they were constantly experimenting with materials, techniques, and scale. So it was a life that was uh, lived with uh, great joy learning new things um, all the time. Uh, but it was also a life where, where she increasingly from being an associate also in a way, uh, she became uh, Nelly's soul sister as Nelly, uh, Nelly's body slowly gave away. So um, this was a very tough and complex relationship. And um, we don't know what Roshan would have done if she had continued 
to have uh, you know to 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 do her own weaving because in her uh, two shows after post Nelly's passing away, you can see that she is in a way continuing the pattern based abstraction um, that Nelly began in the 1960s and the symbolic abstraction uh, from the 70s and 80s uh, as, as part of her um, inheritance uh, of, of, of design repertoire. But then she's also trying out a few things. But I think that she did not have enough time to perhaps, or perhaps she was already also in her late 50s and she had other duties uh, you know, to perform. She had to look after her aging parents. And then she just uh, shut shop. So um, when I uh, visited uh, Roshan um, Muller, um, in in uh, in her um, in in her in, in her in her home, uh, in, in in Princess Street, uh, I I found um, uh, somebody who was uh, uh, ex extremely um, you know she she was she was very endearing she was um, uh, she 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 was uh, on the one hand. Uh, uh, very happy to, to to share the Kalamkari book and the shawl book with me um, and, and share some of the exhibition invite ephemera. But on the other hand, I could also see that whenever I asked her questions about Nelly, her relationship with Nelly, uh, or about the various weaves uh, and the hang wall hangings, um, I didn't really get much from her. She only answered in staccato Parsi Gujarati phrases. Um, and I could not push beyond this. I also knew that because she's such a recluse, she may not grant me another meeting. And I was very fortunate to even have this bit, this one single meeting with her. And um, she, uh, she, she had, uh, like Nelly, she was hugely talented. She, uh, she, she, she did clay modeling in, um, in, in JJ. Uh, she has, uh, she had, a, she had a degree, she has a degree in commercial design from JJ. She also did clay modeling, as I said, and also uh, toy making. And uh, she also did, uh, she also learned ceramics. And um, when she was showing me her soft toys that she'd made herself, I just told her, can I please take a photograph? And she posed for me. And when I was taking the photograph, uh, I saw in the left-hand corner of the photograph, I saw uh, this figurine, which she had made herself from her days, uh, JJ days. And uh, I just found it quite strange. I mean, on the one hand, of course, uh, you know, immediately I was thinking at an art historical level that, I mean, this figurine is a remnant of colonial pedagogy because you have a little girl uh, in a kind of uh, Maharashtrian choli and langoti, and uh, she's carrying a child on her back and the, and the child has, has a head, you know, which is a very Greco-Roman head full of curls. And, uh, and then of course, moving on from art history uh, and, and its references, uh, something else happened to me uh, and, and I realized that this was in a, in a way what Roland Barth would call the punctum in the photograph. And, 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 and uh, I realized that this is exactly what Roshan had been doing all her life for Nelly. She had been carrying her on her back. And it made me think, what does it really mean to carry somebody on your back, to, to love somebody with such extreme devotion, uh, to, to bend with love, to not let go? What does it mean to not, I mean, she could have left Nelly at any time. Uh, she was highly talented herself, but she saw Nelly through her most difficult years. Uh, she was a very devoted companion, along with being an associate of her studio. And um, I started thinking, what is it? I mean, why did she make the sacrifice? And for me, the word sacrifice comes from our mother's and grandmother's generation because it's a word that always made me angry. And I said, you know, I mean, I'd always say my mother, please, let's not talk about sacrifices because in a way it sort of, it abrades your soul, uh, you know, it destroys the self because it's an unequal giving. And then I thought, what is it? I mean, is, is, was Roshan sacrificing her life for Nelly or should we look at Roshan's uh, relationship with Nelly through uh, the prism of, uh, you know, of, of Maitri and Karuna? Uh, these are Buddhist terms, which I, um, deploy and Maitri is you know loving kindness not just kindness but loving kindness and Karuna is compassion and maybe perhaps that's an, another way of being able to read their relationship and that brings me to the end of the lecture which is that uh, throughout the lecture I've been uh, committed to a certain form of what I would call art historical calisthenics 
I'm wrestling with archival documents. I'm wrestling with um, what has been written about Nelly. Uh, I'm providing new frameworks and models. But then I end on a different note. Uh, I wrestle no more. I'm not arguing anymore. What I'm left with is perhaps uh, with, with another question, not an argumentative one, but a calmer question, a reflective one, which says, can research also be an expression of affect and of, of love, of friendship, of tears? And with these thoughts, I, I end the lecture. I once again would like to thank Firoza Godrich for inviting me to share my findings with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>